first of all, Federica, thank you so much for taking the time. I really appreciate it. It's a pleasure. Thank you, Krista. So our plan today was to jump into some energy topics, and I know that you have been covering it quite a lot. I've been active with posting, yes, I have to admit. Yeah. So so what, what's the reason behind it? Is it just because it's so fascinating or...? Yeah, I mean, I'm, um, I think about a year and a half ago, we decided as a group, I mean, it's mainly due to my role in Spotship that we wanted to be a bit more active as, as a brand as well. So I wanted to get my opinions a bit more out there and uh, yeah, the posting commenced. So that's how it got. If you're, if you mean to ask about the LinkedIn, that's mainly how it got, uh, you know, through to where we are today, which is uh, posting almost every day of the week. So quite a lot, but uh, if you mean just in general, you know, on the industry and, uh, you know, how I got close to energy and shipping, I would say mainly um, I got uh, really connected to shipping probably from my family's background. So my dad has been in shipping for almost 40 years and as he is my, let's say, role model for many things in life, he also inspired me to pursue these uh, studies on the subject. Uh, and yeah, then after having studied in it, so after attending business school, actually, my interest became even more rooted and um, I, I I understood I could learn a lot more, uh, let's say, on the energy and shipping markets from it. And, and yeah, I understood that fundamentally these are, uh, you know, uh, industries that are the pillars uh, of our economy. So just got really excited about, you know, continuing further to the studies and also potentially, you know, in a career in it. And uh, yeah, that's how it got. It got me started to, you know, shipping in general. So the first topic that we have chosen to discuss is, is the crude market. And of course, it's a fascinating market in size and an impact. But just to set the backdrop, how do you like to do the introduction to the crude market? Because it's quite fascinating as a whole industry and yeah, it impacts everything almost. Could not agree more. I think, uh, I mean, it is correct to say, as many say, you know, crude is the black gold of the world. So it means it is a pivotal resource. Um, I mean, for the entire economy, actually. And this is since the 1950s, more or less. So we haven't had really a, a, a most, uh, you know, a more impactful commodity, perhaps since then. Uh, so the product really underpins the entire of modern society. We We use it to uh, you know, uh, power the industrial sector to heat our homes. And obviously we provide fuels for, for vehicles and airplanes that, you know, on their own, they have to carry goods, you know, and people all over the world. So it's really the, the base of everything that surrounds us. As an estimate, the oil market, we, we can have, a, I don't know how impactful this number can be in people's heads, but it's worth about two, I mean, the value of it is more than two, trillion dollars so uh, it's a massive massive market um generally speaking if we have to look you know a bit of what's been happening uh, in terms of supply we can think of 2023 as uh, you know being uh, a year which has seen mainly supply from the united states brazil uh, and um, actually a very sharp rise in iranian oil production as well um, and yeah, there's there's been probably something very defining that has happened as well. It's been the demand, which over the years has actually been, uh, you know, very strong, but a bit easy in 2023. Uh, this is mainly due to inflation and uh, a slow economy overall. So that's that's the main uh, things that have happened, uh, you know, in 2023 on on crude. Do you think that one like? could be a misunderstanding for people not in the industry is that you know we've talked about renewable energy for many many years and you had you know the cup meetings etc but when you just look at the data and the numbers the substitution seems very hard to make so if you're in the industry you continuously see how impactful it is but you maybe have to be in the industry to fully understand that Perhaps something which has been a bit confusing for people, um, especially in the recent years with uh, all talks with uh, renewables and, you know, climate change, is how can this, you know, how can oil still be so strong while we're trying, you know, to define a very clean future and, you know, move away from it. So um, I think that much of our shift towards renewables uh, is still, you know, is still not really... Uh, or seriously tainted consumption or 
the production trends of oil and fossil fuels uh, in general continue to dominate the, the energy sphere. Um, this is simply, I think, reflecting the fact that uh, you know, the massive scale at which our world consumes and needs oil annually and the lack of immediately available alternatives to supply this massive consumption. Um, in fact, if we think about, for example, a key focus of COP27 uh, was the phasing out of fossil fuels and, and a move to clean energy, um, trying to make a case for reallocation of capital uh, and, and, you know, just basically trying to really push governments and countries around the world to invest more into the clean energy um, and with a gradual phasing out, of course, as well. Obviously, the execution so far uh, is, is a bit different from, you know, uh, the ideal one because um, the, the massive profits earned by oil companies in the, in the last years have mainly gone into stock buybacks and reinvestments in shareholders showing that the industry is uh, unfortunately still uh, really in demand and obviously it is convinced of the future potential uh, and the need for this product despite all these clean goals. It's quite interesting to see how close you know crude and oil is to politics and then it's all about you know the country's trajectory and narrative and maybe also a bit unpredictable because it's very close into politics at some point, at least if you're in a country that has either oil or trade partners that has a lot of it. Absolutely. I mean, I would have probably discuss a bit of the Middle East on the subject. So uh, I think, you know, all the recent uh, news around disruptions, for example, around, uh, you know, the Red Sea and uh, um, you know, what's been happening with uh, the Houthis attacks, this really uh, makes us understand how geopolitics can affect deeply the entire, uh, you know, dynamics, not only, let's say, trade dynamics, but of course, uh, what is happening with production and with shipping, all of these, uh, you know, elements come into play when we're discussing such a, a hot region as the Middle East. That's a perfect segue because let's go over to the Middle East because there yeah. was a great article in the, in the Economist that it said something like you know the the world gets messier but the impact of the Middle East and the strong countries just increase and maybe that's like a global interesting narrative that that region for several reasons of course is gaining influence gaining power and is that also the view that you have that it will be a very important region going forward. It has always been and obviously will remain so for, for various reasons. Um, so I would say the, the Middle East in general is obviously a very hot region for trade. Um, and as, as I was just mentioning now, uh, sadly, also due to geopolitical implications, because there's a lot of things happening and, you know, uh, various powers that are at conflict in the area. Um, I would say the past couple of years for the Middle East have been uh, of success and really strong growth. Um, actually, numbers that were collected in the past couple of years, uh, especially the ones of 2021, 2022, because numbers of 2023 are not really transparent yet. They're still being kind of collected and analyzed. But you can see that, um, uh, you know, it's it, it's in massive in numbers. So uh, exports generally for the area have amounted to $1.3 million. And uh, this is not only thanks to oil, although it is definitely one of the main commodities for, for the region, because um, it represents, uh, you know, coming from the area, there's one third of global oil production and five of the 10 top oil producers are from this region. So obviously it is a very impacting commodity for, for the Middle East. Um, as of 2023, so in more recent times, um, the economic activity of the area and North Africa region as well, uh, because in general, it can be uh, thought of the MENA region. So uh, all those one bigger group. This has sharply decelerated and also real GDP has uh, plummeted. And uh, this is mainly due to the OPEC plus alliance having had to cut oil output um, just to maintain, because of the slowing demand, this is just to maintain more or less prices uh, aligned to uh, to manage to 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 make the right profits. But obviously, this also meant that you know Mena Energy producers had to sell less oil, um, and yes, this paired 
also to the tightening of global financial conditions and high inflation is really constraining the economic activity right now in the Middle East. Um, I would say that the biggest highlight at the moment for this era is obviously that of the Houthis attack. And, uh, you know, this this is, uh, we just mentioned a second ago, it's one strong example of how disruptive this area of the world can be. And, and yeah, how uh, essentially we're seeing that, you know, vessels, uh, especially tankers, are, are having to, um, you know, just avoid completely the region and... Uh, uh, jump up a number of miles, you know, a voyage just going through, uh, you know, just going all around uh, the Cape uh, of Good Hope and, uh, yeah, transition, transiting towards uh, the USA and Europe to, to uh, through a completely different part of the world, uh, which is lengthier and, of course, a lot more costly. So you brought in the shipping aspect. And if you just view... Uh, if you, if your view is going on the entire situation, do you think that it's very hard to predict anything in 2024 because people have different interests? It's hard to really map out all the potential consequences, but maybe one idea is that it's not going to be resolved in the near term. Or how do you see the, the overall picture like you explained now? In terms of this, uh, this war, you mean, it's Probably, I mean, as unpredictable as it gets, it's, uh, you know, we cannot really say what's going to be, uh, you know, in the next months or in the next year. All we know is that definitely the word geopolitics and conflicts in general, this has been a very relevant word, word in the past three years, actually, because we're, uh, we've seen a, quite a few conflicts. And yes, it's, uh, you know, uh, on the tanker side, it's been uh, extremely positive for owners as rates are quite, you know, volatile in nature already. And the fluctuations have been uh, obviously giving them, um, you know, uh, better profits than usual. Uh, but obviously the risks are very high and, uh, you know, always associated to this industry as well. So with conflict comes also the risk, you know, of having safety issues uh, to the vessels. And you see it as, you know, the Houthi attacks are are all about that. So essentially vessels are being physically attacked with arms and, you know, bombs. And, uh, you know, it doesn't it doesn't get riskier than that for for an owner uh, of a vessel. So, so one topic that was quite big last year, but sort of are a bit overlooked today because of the things going on is, is the situation in the Panama Canal. And it's quite interesting one because it's not like it's a very complicated situation as well, but for different aspects. So just maybe start with, you know, what's the importance of the Panama Canal and also where do you feel the situation is today? So actually, it's a very similar topic to the one we've uh, just been discussing with the Red Sea, because that's the Bab el Mandeb Strait. But in general, so the Panama Canal is another choke point and choke points all around the world are fundamental to the operations of shipping and trade. And uh, yeah, ultimately, these are, you know, even if there are very few around the world, they're they're very important for the world to be able to function because they just cut, you know, uh, you know, uh, trade routes very significantly. So um, obviously, this is why these areas have been uh, historically also the subject of controversies and wars. Uh, and this has happened also in the past with the Suez Canal, etc. So at the moment, or uh, let's actually pick to pick up to what happened last year, which is the Panama Canal has been uh, facing severe drought um, for the entire summer, uh, which led to local authorities authorities to force, uh, um, uh, let's say, to force some measures on the shipping industry, which uh, meant cutting by several meters of max draft the vessels that were allowed through. Uh, and implicating what was an initial, uh, if I remember well, about 20% drop of how many vessels were actually allowed to transit. And obviously, this might seem, let's say, insignificant from, uh, you know, a, a general standpoint, but it's actually, it meant massive consequences, uh, including re rerouting and um, let's say back all container services having either the choice to go let's say through a, a very long wait, uh, uh, let's say through the Panama Canal or 2000 nautical miles through the Suez Canal or 5000 nautical miles around you know, Africa. So obviously shippers had to consider these shifts in order to avoid 
um, issues with you know several weeks ahead of time, and which meant in massive implications from a logistical point of view and, uh, and general uh, network changes and rerouting changes. Uh, and obviously big costs as well, uh, just, you know, to try and, you know, ease trade and obviously to uh, not, uh, let's say, be impact to, to impacted too much from a backlog. Although this backlog, I must say, throughout the year could have hardly be avoided. Uh, in fact, at some point, there were over 200 ships on both sides of the canal that were waiting to pass through. Um, let's say that considering what uh, this backlog could have been, so uh, amounting even to several weeks. Obviously, the freight market uh, felt the effects and um, there was, uh, let's say, increasing demand due to the fact that, of course, uh, you know, ships were being blocked there with cargo on board, so me meaning there was not enough supply either. So there was a disruption in, in the general, uh, you know, market go for all the transit that was going through there, mainly these are, you know, markets affecting, um, you know, South America trades and the U.S. trades, but really all over the world this was felt because, of course, tankers and bulk carriers and gas carriers, they travel throughout the world in order to, uh, you know, to service these different markets. And uh, yeah, it translated into massive freight volatility uh, in all these affected markets and, uh, and yeah, uh, especially for those vessels that had no priority in passage. Mostly, I think this was bulk carriers and gas carriers. And if you can think in terms of numbers, an LPG tanker was known last year to have paid $2.4 million uh, in an auctioned transit slot through the canal, which is, you know, uh, crazy, crazy money. And even uh, tankers without slots were waiting up to four weeks. This is a month to find passage instead of just, you know, couple of days usually so it's it's you know some some really uh, unseen numbers um and generally speaking all the operators were charging premiums of course to carry cargo across the canal and um i think there was also an mr so on the tanker side there was also uh, you know a, a product tanker uh, you know could cost up to even 1 million dollars to pass the uh, the canal and in terms of what's happening today the situation is actually uh, more or less, you know, unchanged in the sense that there's been uh, no real, I mean, there's been some progress in terms of, you know, how to, um, let's say, solve the situation and, you know, just create uh, some, uh, some uh, let's say, um, uh, solutions for this, you know, absence of, of water in the, in the channel and, you know, where to uh, source it from and, you know, if there's some new technology that can be applied to it. So definitely there's been a lot of things uh, that, you know, have been uh, thought through and uh, probably even with uh, some uh, uh, initial applications, but largely the situation is unchanged and the owners, um, I would say, obviously have profited uh, a lot from uh, this turn of events. There's been, uh, you know, a very positive year, a uh, couple of years actually now for owners on on this uh, from this point of view. But um, we can also expect that perhaps, you know, in the in the coming year, and as it always happens, you know, with supply and demand, which kind of corrects itself. Um, you know, it, it happens when markets are allowed to develop freely. I think there's going to be some somewhat to, to some extent, you know, a, a correction of, uh, of of freight as well. And um, from my recent readings and, you know, to what I have been uh, able to inform myself on, uh, the canal administrators are now estimating that uh, actually their, their levels of investment in, in a solution will be instead of the initially estimated $200 million, they will be actually looking at somewhere between 500 and $700 million estimated cost to actually find, uh, you know, a, a long standing and, you know, final solution to uh, the dipping water levels. So we can see that it's probably some some more work in progress for, for the Panama Canal. It's a fascinating situation. Is it as easy as, you know, when you just explained that, you know, there's a huge queue there and some people are willing to pay, you know, million dollars to skip the queue. Is it 
Is it just a question of, you know, if the market is good and the freight rates is high, it's easier to pay that. But if the market is bad, it becomes maybe a bit more complicated situation to really understand what what's the worth of skipping the queue. It seems it's going to be a, at least a quite interesting Excel sheet to fully understand that and who's going to take the yes. cost. Yes, I mean, it's not really simplifiable to, to yeah. very few factors, but of course, I mean, an operator that is, you know, in urgent need, if if it's a trading cargo and the cargo needs to be, you know, finds home uh, at a very, very positive margin. And when you create, you know, your equation, uh, including the shipping costs inside and there's still a profit, then I guess that urgency of shipping it within those dates is justified by, you know, the general profit that you're making by, by selling the cargo. This is more, a, let's say, a, a trading, you know, perspective and not that relevance, you know, for ship owners, they're being paid, obviously, that cost to go through. And uh, yeah, it's all about, you know, the, the, the charter, the vessel, is he, you know, being paid enough to deliver that cargo within that lake, you know, on that date, then definitely they will try to do it. And yeah, I mean, it is only in very few instances, and probably on on contract cargoes that have to be, uh, you know, um, uh, let's say, um, delivered that, you know, they'd be making a loss, but I don't, I wouldn't foresee that, you know, it's, it's always normally, um, you know, justified by a profit made on the cargo side that the shippers are able to, to then pay through the entire transaction all the way down to, you know, the owner having to transit. So yeah. if you see the connection, I yeah. hope it was clear. Yeah, it makes sense. So just to wrap up, you know, the macro perspective, we're heading into the second month of 2024. Do you think these are going to be the big topics to follow ahead? Or do you have any other, you know, candidates or things that you would like to keep an eye on personally? Well, definitely uh, there's there's a few trends in perspective for oil and trading. Uh, and there's some trends that are expected to be seen already. Um, as we said also earlier, global oil supply is actually forecasted to rise over demand in the coming year. If we were to talk about, you know, between OPEC and non-OPEC, so the non-OPEC production will dominate, while the OPEC plus will mainly hold steady, is or at least expected to hold steady. Um, the increases in global oil demand are also set to, we already mentioned, they will drop and are probably set to half, more or less. And this is due to GDP growth, um, which is below trend, and uh, generally speaking, the adoption of a lot of the, uh, you know, energy efficiency of improvements that we've, uh, as you know, as in economies, as a global world, we've been, uh, you know, discussing for, for many years now. So there's uh, more and more of these efficiencies that are getting, uh, let's say, adopted. Um, and yeah, uh, already crude oil futures at the moment, they're so far rising due to geopolitical trends in the Middle East. So this is another massive topic, I think, for 2024, generally speaking, the word geopolitics. So um, yeah, there's uh, as global oil supply disruptions uh, from this conflict remains elevated currently and will remain elevated potentially you know, throughout the year unless there's some solution that is being found. We expect, you know, these these prices to 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 be higher, and of course, you know, freight as well on the shipping side to be very volatile and perhaps sustained. Um, and and uh, yeah, I think uh, basically these are the major, uh, you know, if we have to really look at twenty twenty four as a you know as a whole as a year, what is going to be the biggest topic? It's probably be it's probably going to be if I have to put one word on it, geopolitics. And uh, yeah, the Red Sea situation. Um, I would say um, currently the diversions still represent so the ships going through, uh, opting to not go through uh, the canal there are still representing a small fraction of the total imports, but if the disruptions do not stop and if the tensions in the area escalates, of course, this could only, you know, trigger uh, a, a more and more impactful changes in freight, in trade costs and, you know, insurances and everything else connected. Um, so, yeah, I would say, in, you know, oil prices in general are not only going to be, uh, you know, um, let's say affected by these 
geopolitics, but of course also on any, you know, um, extended OPEC plus supply curtailment and also weather related general. Generally, you know, these are the factors that really affect, um, you know, the oil prices at large. So also weather uh, conditions, as we've seen, for example, the Panama Canal performing last year due to drought. So these um, these will top off, you know, the year. I think that's a that's a great summary. And you mentioned it already in, in the early beginning, but the, I thought the next segue would be a bit about your career, how you ended up there. But just to recap, so yeah. it was basically your family uh, involvement in shipping that made you quite interesting from an early age or did that grow? Because I think that also can backfire to have that conversation around the dinner table every day growing up that you either want to work with that or you just say, I want to do something else. A very good point, actually. <laughs> I mean, I would say because of the nature, I mean, a lot of people on the commercial side of shipping, you know, they, they tend to be, I mean, they say shipping is not a job, you know, it's a lifestyle. So basically this uh, definitely was, you know, a keyword for, for my father, meaning it always brought, you know, he always brought the conversation back to the family. He was, he's always been very, you know, open and discussing, you know, his, uh, his uh, deals or, you know, things that, you know, happened in his life and, you know, on a professional level, because it was such a big part of his life. And I just thought it was a very, you know, uh, exciting, you know, the way that he, pictured it and you know the way that he spoke about it was just like so dynamic so exciting all these things happening so as I'm a bit of a you know I like adrenaline as a personality I like this excitement I thought it would be you know so cool to to try to work in shipping as well I think what initially happened I mean the early age definitely was uh, you know the the knowledge that the shipping industry even existed because I don't think a lot of people you know, outside of the industry, even know how big, uh, you know, of um, of a world it is, and of course, how many things happen in it. So already knowing about it was a first step. And then when I went through uh, my bachelor, actually, um, I went through a couple of universities, including Bocconi, which uh, kind of programs you in a in the best positive way, uh, you know, to become somebody. Uh, you know, highly performing and, you know, um, working potentially, you know, for investment banks or a consulting company. So I thought it was a bit, uh, you know, I had this outlook of life that was too standardized in that sense. I mean, everybody was going to do more or less the same things or everybody was trying to be planned to do the same things. And I wanted to do something a bit more special. And this brought me back to this initial experience of, oh, shipping is so exciting why don't I continue my studies in that? And I and I really want to, you know, potentially uh, create a career like a lifelong career in it. And and yeah, that's that's basically what led me then to uh, apply for business school at uh, once called Cast Business School, and actually today it's called Base Business School. Recently changed name, and and yeah, that's uh, you know after that I think it's um, it was all you know. Uh, work and you know career but this was my initial step into the shipping industry probably um you know wanting to apply to business school and understanding more of it from mm -hmm. from an educational standpoint as well can you explain a bit uh, the thought process of academia versus shipping because you have some people in shipping who says that shipping all is all about the people being in the market executing and then maybe you have some people who say, no, you really need the education to understand that because shipping, I guess, is a bit unique in the sense that it is very network driven and people driven. So is that just like a plus plus combination if you can do school or do you think there's several paths into a successful shipping career? Well, I think it really depends on the person and, you know, what you need at and also at the age, you know, the age at which you're trying to to take your first steps into any career. So I think it's valid for the shipping business, but in general for every, uh, you know, career that you want to get into. So if you already feel very convinced and you have an idea already of how to perform the job, because maybe, you know, people, uh, you know, that, you know, have been working in a particular sector and, uh, you know, you, you have more or less clarity. That's like the biggest thing. And you are convinced. So if you feel confident about something, of course, you will try to perform in it already. As, you know, young people normally, you know, in their early 20s, between 18, 20 years old, 
you want to try to understand a bit more and probably, you know, go one foot uh, uh, ahead of the other. So as slowly as possible without throwing yourself into, um, you know, a job without a safety net. So without uh, uh, people that advise you, you know, or, or give you a perspective on it, then maybe, you know, in that case, it, it is a good idea to try to uh, advance, you know, your first steps through a business school or, you know, the educational path first. I would say, I mean, personally, um, if if I have to like um, overview what kind of experience I had with with base business school and generally uh, having masters in shipping, I would say it was a fantastic experience. So I, I would highly recommend it because uh, you you're kind of put in a in an accelerated path to what is then going to be work. So you you even have more intense uh, you know tasks and uh, and discipline being demanded from you than probably the workplace the uh, for the initial couple of months i think the course is is really challenging and obviously it gives you this you know perspective what what real life is you know having to work from uh, you know uh, 9 to 6 or even more extended times as is very common you know for uh, roles in commercial shipping so it really prepares you mentally and I think uh, more mentally and physically than necessarily from an academic point of view so that's probably the biggest connection to business school is being able to create a mentality for work and not just you know the right skill set because the skill set is always easier you know to actually practice and to acquire when you're in the workplace and there's nothing that is really going to prepare you ultimately you know to, to being able to work. It's always going to be just your mentality around it. And yeah, I, I, I all, honestly, I mean, from my perspective, I, I definitely recommend business school. Uh, and as you mentioned as well, the network, um, it's so it's not really just really good, you know, to prepare you mentally, but also, you know, to allow you to meet a lot of like-minded people that uh, obviously have very similar interests to you for one reason or the other. And, you know, these connections that you can make, uh, which are your peers, but also, you know, your the professors themselves. I mean, these are people that are highly skilled and, you know, know a lot of people. They can really uh, try to help you understand what is the best thing for you. And, you know, I, I had um, personally, you know, great relationships with all of my professors. I, I still, you know, speak to most of them. So it's great to see how things, you know, are all connected and and yeah the network is a massive part you know of life but you know mainly for shipping it's it's probably one of the most important uh, you know values i mean having uh, friendships everywhere because this sector is very niche so when somebody gets in it uh, amazingly enough and so, for one reason or the other they hardly get out of shipping so you're always going to be finding the same people in different roles uh, kind of like circularly, um, you know, kind of like uh, moving between maybe companies or, you know, one role or the other, but you will always find them around you. So friends remain friends and they remain in the industry, which is, you know, uh, very impactful for your own, you know, uh, uh, for, for the way that you can also work uh, and obviously, you know, um, create, you know, strategies for your own role as well. I think that's a that's a perfect summary. So, you know, if you're commercially driven, like the adrenaline, like you said, maybe broker is a is a position you you can there's an there's a way to to envision yourself as a broker. So for people who just want to understand how that job is, because I think that job maybe ties well into it's it's not a job, it's a lifestyle because you can have long days. Can you just give us an impression on how it is to is how it is to be a broker? Because it's quite a unique and yeah, thrilling job, but also comes with ups, ups and downs, I guess. I, I loved being a broker. I was a broker for about 10 years before then, you know, jumping into this adventure of of being a chief commercial for Spotship. But um yeah, my my life as a broker, it's I would say being a broker, most of the brokers will also, I think, agree with me. It's almost like a drug. Essentially, what you're doing is you're the intermediary role. So you create, you know, the dialogue between the ship owning um, figures. So the ship owning world and the chartering world, which is 
trading uh, houses and you know oil majors and you're creating the freight market so you're following it you're understanding you know what what happens every day you're chasing information of uh you know the main events you know of the day prior or of the the entire week you're giving both a micro perspective of what's happening uh you know from a uh, day to day which owner has gone you know on subjects to which uh uh, you know, oil major, but also a macro perspective of what's happening, you know, with general trends, because of course, all clients want to be advised, you know, in a more long term sense. And uh, yes, I mean, a broker is many, many things in, in one role. Um, I would say they they are, you know, negotiators, they are analysts, they are, um, you know, friends and psychologists as well. You have to be on the phone with many people every day. It's long hours and uh, obviously not only trying to understand the general perspective on the market and what's happening within that market, uh, but you also have to do it very fast, very accurate, uh, very accurately and, you know, under a lot of pressure because you have the responsibility of your clients on your shoulders. Uh, the actions that you take are going to be reflected in their uh, and their deals, I mean, whatever they close as well, and they give you all of this responsibility as well. So it is, you know, it is a huge, very highly performing, uh, you know, role and uh, very intense. I would say, though, I was I bring it back to my phrase, it's almost like a drug, because once you start, you know, having satisfaction and creating a, a, a flow of activity for you, then obviously, uh, you know, you you want more of it, and obviously you want to try to perform very well in it. And this is this happens with the most successful brokers. Uh, they just feel this constant satisfaction in um and you know in in delivering for their delivering for their clients and servicing their clients. So in being able to create value added for them and you know uh, find the best you know match between ships and cargoes and you know the best rates etc and the ultimate information level so so yes i mean it's um it's a very very exciting job you can also tell a bit about you know spot ship because is it fair to say that that tool that you're building is to help the broker be more efficient be better at work etc and then you've, you've been a broker for 10 years so you maybe you're creating the product you wish you had 10 years ago i mean the the interface itself was actually a bit of the um, you know, kind of like the child of my dissatisfactions uh, in using other, you know, other kinds of software. So I wanted, you know, some modifications to happen and kind of like the best of, of many different worlds and a bit of a futuristic approach on how I could perform, you know, uh, my day-to-day -day role. And, it, you know, the interface was created um, respecting these ideas as well but yes what we're trying to do with spot ship these days is uh, we could say our mission really is to help you know commercial players at large in the industry to make better use of their time and their data and this we do by applying several tools uh to their day-to-day -day, something um which uh, puts together the ai parsing of commercial data technical specifications of vessels the live location of vessels and, you know, many, many calculators, any tool that we or our clients can imagine to essentially, uh, you know, uh, make better use of their data and time, we create, we put into play and yes, in a as bespoke manner as possible and with really positive and uh, present customers uh, service as well. So we're trying to target different angles in which um, the broker and most commercial players were uh, you know, we're lacking and, uh, yeah, we're trying to support, you know, the industry with, the uh, with these, um, with these, uh, positive points, let's say. So yeah, definitely spot ship is, is something which was born to help brokers as a very start, you know, to, to basically help them, you know, fix, uh, faster and very accurately. So with a, with a couple of clicks, they're able to, you know, create position lists and to have already an idea of what can be the best, you know, match, uh, and, uh, for, for the cargoes that they need to fix. And this, um, you know, the, the core of everything is really, um, being able to do so without, uh, basically zero manual inputting when I was a broker. Um, and this is really, uh, something significant for most of the tanker brokers as well. 
uh, so as a segment in general, I was spending between probably three to four hours a day uh, inputting manually data within a platform just to then have an output. By midday, you wanted to create a you know, position list, send it out to your clients. So the three to four hours, I think everybody would agree, you know, data inputting, it's a bit of a, I mean, we could call it donkey work. Let's say it's not adding value to anybody. It's not adding value to the broker, not to the final clients. You're not being, as a broker, you're not being patted on the back for doing that that job. I mean, this is the bare minimum. Being able to input data is something which we always thought should be more for a machine to do, or sometimes, you know, a junior does it, but even a junior could have better use of its time. The ultimate value adding, let's say, task for a broker is to really be on the phone, create relationships with his owners, uh, you know, find, you know, information, shift information, be kind of like this, this point of data to his customers, but he needs to be able to relate this, this data. So, of course, the spending the time on the phone is the biggest part and we're uh, with spot, spot chip essentially we're decreasing this amount of hours of manual inputting from three to four to zero because everything is being done in a very very reliable way from our ai parser uh, which um is today somewhat of a market leader our accuracy level is around 99.7 percent which is extremely high versus uh, you know, what other softwares in the market can do and um, which uh, actually sit at between 90, uh, 90 to 91% as a uh, industry standard for these kind of parsers. So we're very, very happy of what we can deliver for clients and our clients, you know, tell us they're happy as well and hopefully uh, they are and the growing number of them will will be. And, um, and yes, that's that's kind of our mission where we're sitting at right now. So only two quick quick questions left. So the first one being, we have a lot of ambitious people who are thinking about maybe starting a, a new company within the shipping industry. It's known to be quite traditional. Do you have any over th or big thoughts about how easy it is to build something new in the shipping industry? Are they ready for innovation, digitalization, or is it you really have to understand the industry to make an impact in it? I would say having an understanding of, of the industry for shipping is quite fundamental in the sense that you need to know how people think in it and, you know, obviously what the real key problems are within the industry. But this, I would say, you know, as any new, if you want to do anything new in a sector, I think you need to have um, an industry expert or you need to have some kind of understanding um, you know, of the thought process within that industry. Having just an idea of something that could work is probably not enough. You need to really uh, dig deeper and, you know, probably understand the language of the people that, you know, are users and, you know, uh, need need the kind of technology you want to propose. So probably industry expert, I would say, yes, spending time, you know, young people need to be ready to spend time in the industry prior probably to wanting to do something from scratch. Uh, I think it is always key to understand and to keep in mind that even if, you know, if you're young and you want to go fast and you want to do something of your own, you need to be ready to work hard. And I think to have a very strong spirit of sacrifice, like sense of sacrifice, and to be resourceful. And this only comes with a bit of the, um, you know, pivotal years of learning probably within a role, which is, you know, a, a more junior role and understanding what would really, um, you know, working hard means. And after that, I think you are prepared to face something on your own as well. But I wouldn't, you know, just, uh, you know, probably get out of school and start something from scratch. This is, you know, for some people can be done. I mean, some people have these, uh, you know, skill sets and qualities already on, have a very strong vision. And maybe even just a year of business school can give you that, you know, enough expertise in the industry. But I would say having a bit of, of the, uh, you know, the, the junior, you know, trial and error within a, within a very high paced and, you know, more intense career, give you a, a strong sense of where you can go after and in, in terms of how open the industry is to novelty, I would say definitely after COVID, 
And after, you know, the fact that the entire world has been in lockdown and we've seen, you know, many changes in, um, you know, even how the work is organized, many people have been able to work from home for the first time. And obviously from a sustainability angle, we've seen massive new goals being set, you know, for uh, the the shipping industry by but at large you know for the for the general economy um so uh going towards you know a clean future and more uh tech savvy future as well because technology is imperative when we're talking of um you know having a a more effective and clean future as well we need we need to help ourselves with more data and data processing also comes you know with um with technology so all of these uh, trends and all of these uh, key happenings, I think, have opened the mentality to many players, the big and the smaller companies as well, have started to understand that, of course, I mean, they have to, you know, open their eyes and open their ears to to novelty. And I think there is a bit of, uh, you know, more maturity in the industry to accept, you know, uh, and adopt new technology essentially so so yes i i think the uh, the potential is there and you know there's uh, i think shipping these days is the land of opportunity and there's a lot more than um uh, to be done in it that's a great piece of advice so just a last question federica if you have the time do you have any favorite books you can recommend the audience either about shipping energy or something personal or business related so two nice classics that I've uh, read uh, not recently. I have to admit this; these are very big classics. Are the King of Oil and Oil Kings? Um, they're they're two big pillars, you know, in terms of trading and oil. What I'm currently reading is completely different. I'm reading uh, actually The Goal by Goldratt and Influence by Cialdini, and these are more spotship relevant reads and just, uh, you know, more in tune with my CCO responsibilities. So that's, that's where I'm, you know, where my reading is at right now, <laughs> but oh, not no. as exciting as the oil reads. That's for sure. We'll uh, link to them in the show notes. And once again, thank you so much for taking the time. It was a pleasure having you on. Thanks a lot, Chris.